Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles show called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about all things Beatles. Could be anything that's a part of their history or anything going on in the news or anything in between. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, also known from my syndicated Beatles program called Baby Little Thing. Being joined by my regular co-hosts of the program, first of all, we've got the writer for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. And we've got two of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, beginning with Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello, everybody. And we've also got Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. And on today's show, we got uh, another special guest with us. This is someone that uh, I've long admired. He's got uh, you know quite a resume in radio, and he's been a fixture in New York radio on WFUV for is it twenty five years, Darren? Something like that. The thirty. Thirty. But who's oh, counting? My goodness. <laughs> Anyway, Darren DeVivo is known for being uh, a Beatle expert. He always fits in Beatles, if he can, on his radio show. Absolutely. And, How uh, are you? And uh, as a matter of fact, he's also been on many panels at the Fest for Beatle Fans at, in uh, New Jersey and recently in New York. So we welcome Darren DeVivo to our show. Hi, Darren. How are you? Thank you for having me. I thought that we'd talk about something that recently came up in the news, and um, that's only because... Since uh, I look at Facebook quite often, sometimes too often, I saw a video that uh, was shared amongst a lot of Beatle fans, and it's called Lennon or McCartney. And this is basically uh, a 35-minute, they're calling it a documentary, I wouldn't really call it that, but it's basically for uh, that length of time, the director for this film, whose name is Matt Schichter, he interviewed 550 artists. Uh, by artists, I mean musicians, celebrities, all types of people. And he asked a very simple question, Lennon or McCartney? And so basically what he did was he went to all these different people. He did long interviews with each one of them, but somewhere in the interviews he also asked this question. And um, so you got to see for this 35 minutes the reaction of lots of different people in the industry and whether they prefer Lennon or McCartney. And I know that all of us here in the group have watched this, and I'd like to know, because when I first saw this, I kind of frowned on it, and I was saying, why bother? You know. Uh, but then, as I'm watching it, I'm actually getting drawn into this, and I can't. sometimes I can't understand why. But I like to hear the different answers that people gave in this documentary, and in just a few instances, why they chose one or the other. But uh, I'd like to start by asking each of you, Whenever there's a poll or, or, or a list of any kind like this, do you take it seriously? And is it really some kind of document of the time, the way the public feels, in this case, whether they prefer one, one writer over the other? So since, Darren, you're our special guest in the show today, I thought we'd start with you. Sure, put me on the spot. <laughs> um, I, no, I don't, I don't take, um, you know, this is so... It, it, it was so informal of a poll and you had so many people who waffled back and forth between Paul and John. Uh, and probably some of them would give different answers if they were asked uh, a week later or something. I don't, I don't really didn't really come away with all that much from this other than it's an entertaining poll. The only thing that um, did stand out and which wasn't a surprise to me is um, I did start the first time I watched it, tried to keep track of how many John votes and how many Paul uh, nods there were. And it was seemingly was going John's way. And then I gave up uh, trying to keep track. When it was all said and done, it was clearly a John crowd. Uh, mm. So there's, I think anything that come away with it, I think, and I've always felt this, John was probably the more popular of the two. And that's reflected in this documentary. But again, it's so informal, nothing scientific about it. And ultimately, nothing that uh, that really I came away that changed my views or should change anyone else's views on on whether they think or whether they prefer Paul or John, uh, you know, together or apart. We have the actual mm -hmm. score from the end, if you want. It was John 282, Paul 196, no answer, 50. 
George Harrison, 15, Ringo Starr, 4, and then Jimi Hendrix, Lou Reed, Keith Richards, and, of all people, Oasis, each got one vote. <laughs> there were a couple yeah. of people that also said both, uh, too, that they didn't count. Yeah, that's true. Reason. Yeah. Right. I didn't hear the Lou Reed, but... Uh... I didn't hear Oasis, but I may have been filtering. <laughs> yeah, I did hear mm. Oasis. <laughs> okay. Darren, when you said that um, you thought that no matter what, John would be the more popular of the two, why did you think that? Because commercially, Paul has sold the most records. I think there is uh, a perception that uh, that John is the cooler of the two. I think there has always been that perception uh, that John was the cooler of the two. Paul would uh, was capable of giving us some um, fairly uh, lightweight material from time to time. John, of course, seemed to be uh, uh, the more aggressive uh, of the two personalities. Uh, and, um, and and to try to word this as gently as I can, uh, I think that um, the way John died, the fact that John uh, did die and uh, and was killed and in the manner it happened, a lot of times those particular individuals tend to get put on a higher pedestal as time goes by uh, than if they were still with us. Um, and I do think that John is perceived as the cooler of the two because he is no longer with us. Uh, I think that's been the case with uh, some musicians without naming names that are probably have a greater place in history because they have, uh, they are no longer with us. And I think that, you know, over the years, John Lennon has uh, found himself on a, a higher pedestal as uh, as a rock and roll hero because of the fact he's no longer here and in the manner in which he was taken from us. Yeah. How about the rest of you? Uh, Alan, did you take this, this poll seriously at all? Well, not too seriously. I'm not even sure it was meant seriously. But it is a better question to throw in at the end of an interview than say, you know, if you were an animal, what kind of animal would you be? I mm -hmm. think, it, you know, I mean, it, 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 it does, it is an actual question. You know, if you want to get some sense of, of what people prefer and, and these were all actors and singers and a lot of young songwriters. Uh, it was kind of interesting to me that a lot of young songwriters uh, actually were McCartney fans rather than Lennon fans. But, you know, and, and, and I guess this is a sort of time-honored debate. Um, I remember when, you know, in the, in the period just after the Beatles broke up, uh, there was a lot of partisanship of John versus Paul, partly because even though, you know, George and Ringo were out there doing things too, John and Paul in particular seemed to be sniping at each other with, you know, too many people on RAM and then, you know, how do you sleep on Imagine and, and John, you know, holding the pig uh, in, a, in a parody of the RAM cover, one of the pictures on the RAM cover. Um, there seemed to be a bunch of that, and, and you were almost tempted to take sides. And Darren's perception that John is, is thought of as cooler – I think goes back to that period even even more than uh, because of his death, um, because back then you were sort of weighing everything in terms of what was coming out, and so John was putting out you know give me some truth, and Paul was putting out Mary had a little lamb, and that was probably the the starkest contrast um, that that people focused on at the time, but yeah I mean it was it was sort of a, a fun little poll, but I. I I don't think anyone takes it that seriously, including people who did it. Mm. You mentioned Mary Had a Little Lamb. Paul was also putting out... Uh, Give Mother Ireland Back to the Lightning. Irish. So, <laughs> yeah. Sure, and, and yeah. a lot of great rockers, too. Right. So uh, how about you, Al? I don't really take it very seriously at all. Uh, again, like you, as, as Alan said, it's that, it's that kind of of uh sort of end end type question you know you know uh, like you said if you were an you know what animal would you be or uh what kind of a tree would you be or any you know that's that that sort of thing so uh you know i don't really take it that seriously but i think uh, darren has a point though in in saying that that john is 
I think maybe his appeal, especially for some of the younger rockers, uh, especially alternative rockers. Uh, I think John has always been kind of a, you know, almost a patron saint because of the fact that he is frozen in time, you know, that he never, uh, you know, that we never, you know, one of the things we were uh, robbed of was the fact that we never got to see him develop musically, not only as a person move through middle age and into seniorhood, but also how his music would have developed in the, you know, in the 80s and, and beyond. You know, whereas where he's frozen, although ironically, the, you know, the last recordings he made, the the Double Fantasy Milk and Honey recordings, uh, were, are not at all the, you know, the unreconstructed rock and roller, but in fact, uh, uh, were really much more pop, not soft rock, but certainly more melodic than uh than I think a lot of people associate with like the you know the plastic ono band era mm. John they were more, more McCartney ish yes yes <laughs> exa- especially especially woman especially grow old with me songs like that were you know certainly much more poppy or melodic if you will than uh than you know well 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 Right. You know, mm-hmm. So, but, you I know, know. so I, I, I think to an extent he's become kind of frozen in history in that in that way for, you know, succeeding generations who, you know, were not, you know, around to see his career, you know, a, a firsthand. I realize that Steve hasn't spoke yet, but very quickly, I've always mm-hmm. felt as a music fan that Jim Morrison's place in history has been... Uh, made larger than life uh, mm-hmm. because he's no longer here and the nature of his death and the the mystique about Jim Morrison. I wonder if he would be thought of so highly had he grown old and maybe some of that uh, that legacy maybe had time to tarnish a bit. Same with Kurt Cobain's place in history. Kurt Cobain lived that life and that mm-hmm. life took him he is now uh, almost turned into a saint in the alternative and indie rock music world. I don't know mm-hmm. if that necessarily would be his legacy had he lived, and I think the same could be said for John Lennon. Yeah, almost the whole 27 Club, you know, that that bizarre phenomena of the, the fact that so many pop stars – who died in their 20s happened to die at 27 mm-hmm. you know and you know like as Darren says you know what you know what the perception would be of those artists if they had lived and had and if their careers had gone in a certain in a certain direction yeah it's, it's a fascinating thing I mean you mentioned this business Al of being frozen in time mm-hmm. and you can you can also apply that to a buddy Holly or someone who was really taken from us at such a young age, who had mm-hmm. so much promise, and you don't know what would have happened had that person lived. Yeah. But uh, you know, but we we know what we know while they were alive, mm-hmm. and we treasure those memories and the music that these people have given us, right. and that will never change. How about you, Steve? Well, as far as taking the whole thing seriously, no, I didn't take it very seriously at all. I mean, these kind of thing uh, i mean it's a cute it's a cute question and it's kind of you know fun to see the answers you know the big thing for me was that i i you know more than half of these people i'd never even heard of Hmm. it was interesting to see you know the response by justin bieber uh (laughs) lady gaga you know uh, big you know big deal but i mean it was interesting to see the few you know, uh, a, re- a couple of responses by people I knew. The um, Pete Townsend one kind of surprised me that he he picked McCartney over Lennon. That mm-hmm. blew me over completely. I was quite shocked about that. But generally, no. I mean, there's really not anything to take seriously here. As far as the Lennon versus McCartney thing, you know, I think it's pretty well going along with the way it's been since Lennon died. That Lennon has 
kind of been, and I know, you know, this is kind of going to hit the McCartney fans, but Lennon's been kind of put on a pedestal a little bit um, since he died, you know, and I think that's where the inequality of the the um, opinions Lennon over McCartney kind of comes from. So I, that didn't totally surprise me, but uh, the couple of responses did I, I like I like I wouldn't take this very seriously at all really I mean it's it, it's a cute idea though and and uh the fact that he they went through uh you know all these people there were a couple uh, responses I think Al was we were talking earlier about Bo Diddley being mm-hmm. on there at all I mean that was kind of a surprise but no I really couldn't take this very seriously it's one of these you know things like they pass around Facebook you just kind of go oh okay so wasn't really I was too young, you know, at the time that they broke up to even uh realize anything, but at the time of the breakup in nineteen seventy, when the when that became common knowledge, from the beginning, didn't the media always paint Paul as the bad guy and, and John is the hero? Uh from from the very beginning, Paul's responsible because he came public saying the break the, the the Beatles are breaking up so therefore he's going to be our the one we're going to hammer and John's going to be uh, the one we prefer I don't think I don't so know. I, yeah, I, I don't I, uh, yeah I mean uh, the way I remember it um was that Paul made the announcement but um and and this may seem like hindsight but I think everybody kind of knew that John had wanted out earlier I mean he hinted at this in some of his interviews with Howard Smith, which are now pretty widely mm-hmm. available. Um, yeah. he, he hinted that the, that he didn't see the Beatles going on as they were. And even his discussions of the, at the time, unreleased Get Back slash Let It Be sessions. I mean, he, he talked in, in the Howard Smith interview at the time about, uh, about that being, it's finally showing the Beatles with their trousers off, um, and this will sort of split the myth. Um, so you had the idea that John was kind of down on the whole thing anyway, and, and Paul made the announcement, but, um, despite the scene in, uh, what was it, Apollo 17, where the girl says, I hate Paul, and locked herself in the room because he announced it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that was the wide perception, at least among people who followed closely enough to, to be listening to these interviews that the others were giving. Um, also, though, at, at the same time, um, there was, I believe, a, a pretty wide knowledge of what the business problems were. I mean, there was a headline at the time about John saying that they were all going to be broke, and it was known that there was a, a dispute about whether Alan Klein should represent them. And in fact, in another of the Howard Smith interviews with George Harrison, um, which I think was like May 1st, 1970, so this is actually technically after Paul has made his announcement. George seemed mm-hmm. to be saying it's not necessarily over, but the way he explained it was, you know, there are four of us and we all want to do three of us want to do one thing and one of us wants to do something else. And the problem is that we don't have to go home to it every day. <laughs> that was right out there, you know, um, mm. kind of unusually frank uh, for for mm. that kind of interview, um, particularly since Howard Smith's um, recollection was that he and Harrison didn't get along at all. He thought Harrison really hated him for some reason, but Harrison gave him kind of a scoop right there. Anyway. And, you know, um, Steve and I, when we did a, a show on the Howard Smith, uh, the George Harrison interview, it was kind of fascinating that in that interview, George had said it would have been selfish for the Beatles to split up. Hmm. So he still had in the back of his mind, you know, the thought that they might continue. So, yeah. you know, it may very well be that, for, at least in, in his case, the Beatles were kind of left in limbo and nothing was really official at that point, maybe in his mind. But anyway, getting back to this documentary, my own perception of this is that, you know, I find it fascinating only because of the fact that there's a lot of young artists who are in here, and I'd like to know how they feel. But by the same token, it's also kind of sad because I look at everything that all all four Beatles have done from you know from the very beginning through all the solo music, and it's very obvious to me that the general public really 
when they think of any of the four of them, they think of them for what they did in the group first. And for some of them, they may not know much more beyond that. So Mm -hmm. the perception that they have of John or Paul may be strictly just the Beatles group catalog with a few classics in the solo careers. And, you know, that's it's pretty obvious when I watch this that that's kind of how they feel. You know, when they talk about any of them, it's always they all needed each other. It's always thought of as collectively as the group when, you know, the sad reality of it all is that if you were to take all, you know, the entire catalog of group and solo music, what they did as a band, which may historically always be more important, is 20 percent of that catalog. Mm. You know, so. You were just saying something that I found kind of interesting, Darren, about when you were talking about John's music on Double Fantasy being McCartney-esque, which I never thought at all. But why is there this perception? See, again, it's going back to what I'm just saying now, because I think of the entire body of work of the Beatles. If you were to study Paul McCartney's solo career and you knew all the different genres of music that he's tackled, he's done so much more than the poppy stuff. But he's so well known for that, that that's the image that has stuck with him. You know, and when you made the comment that you thought, you know, songs like Woman would be kind of McCartney-esque, which, I, you know, when that album came out, I never thought that. I thought Woman was the most Beatles-esque song on the album. But why do you think there is that image that still has been prolonged all these years for John or Paul that, you know, that Paul is so much the poppy guy? Because if you were to really study his entire solo work, you've got... Paul doing everything from classical music to country music to experimental stuff with the fireman. You know, he's done a lot of rockers. He's not just the the polished pop artist. There's more to him than silly love songs. But there's a lot of people out there that have that image stuck in their brains that that's how Paul is perceived. And do you think that that's fair? I don't think it definitely isn't fair. And especially since Paul has never shied away, like you mentioned, the fireman, Paul has never shied away from tackling genres of music that uh, are for the young folks, not the older folks, Um, Mm. getting into electronic stuff and ambient stuff. And uh, Paul has has never shied away from doing that. I don't know why he still will, and he probably always will be perceived as the sweeter, poppy, cutesy beetle, I, I guess it goes down to just perceptions. The first perception you you make of a person sometimes ends up being the one that you that stays with you, mm. regardless of what happens. Uh, you know, as years pass, as years pass by, it's an old ebony and ivory and say 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 live louder or have 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 left more of a mark, unfortunately, than some of the new more recent stuff or fireman stuff or heavier rocking stuff. For whatever reason that is, that perception's there and probably always will be there. Hmm. That's also because those two songs you mentioned got a ton of airplay, whereas his more recent stuff hasn't. So, well, you can right, kind yes. of you can kind of tell even from watching this documentary and hearing some of the comments, you can tell that a lot of these people, a lot of these artists, you know, really they pretty much stopped listening to Paul around that time in the early 80s. Because you can tell that, uh, you know, they just kind of um, slough off anything that he's done since then, probably without ever hearing it. Because let's yes. face it, he hasn't had a hit record in, you know, a long time. So mm. it's very, very possible that a lot of, young, especially a lot of younger artists or singer songwriters or what you know whatever have uh, probably haven't heard anything of his in uh you know since maybe the mid 80s you mm-hmm. know it's 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 uh, it's very possible so that would then reinforce that image of Paul as the you know the poppy the poppy songwriter of pardon the expression, silly love songs, Mm -hmm. Uh you know, that, you know, that, that perception that has gone on for so long. And even though he's done great work in the last, the the better part of the last two decades, it's, it's not material that the masses have really heard, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I would think that a number of the music heads that were in that documentary, uh, are in the know like we are as fans because they're 
they're in the trenches and 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 are up on what everyone is doing today, not just the former Beatles. And you would think that you know I would think that a lot of those musicians are aware and have heard and know of oh yeah uh, chaos was an album that Nigel Godrich produced and I'm going to work with Nigel uh, next week or you know something mm-hmm. like that. I think it's probably more likely though that they're that they're probably more familiar with the work of their you know kind of their contemporaries mm-hmm. and that the uh, you know what they call now the senior artists or heritage artists uh, that they really don't pay that much attention to uh, uh, you know to their work you know that even even though a Nigel Godrich uh, produced uh, Chaos and Creation you know maybe they might have heard one or two songs but you know certainly nothing beyond that you know Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. because let's face it and Darren you know this as well as anybody uh, those those records you know aside from people like you or or you know Beatles Beatles shows playing that material you know for the you know at least the, in the mainstream those those records have just not gotten any you know any attention at all no you know and this goes this goes all the way back to uh, Flaming Pie or even maybe even beyond that so that's you know that's probably why a lot of younger listeners just they're not at all that familiar with his uh, with his newer material. Mm. And that's really a shame because as far as I'm concerned, you know, I love his entire body of solo work, but I do Mm -hmm. happen to feel that as much as I love the whole Wings period, he really experimented so much more after Wings and branched out so much more. So a lot of people aren't even aware of that. And Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, there was a very interesting moment in there when – the songwriter Joel Plaskett was interviewed, and he he actually said that he prefers both John and Paul their solo work to their work as the Beatles. And mm. then the uh, the director actually said to him, "Really, even the later McCartney work? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as if you know that we must all feel that his later stuff is not as good as yeah. I guess, his early solo work." Exactly. There was another yeah. moment too when somebody kind of. Uh, you know, brushed off the the eighties post wings, McCartney. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that decade was wasn't any good. Right? Huh? Do you you know why do you suppose? And even uh, a few of the people who are interviewed thought of John as being the more groundbreaking of the two of them as artists. I mean, we associate John so much for you know having the guts to bear his soul to the world with songs like On Plastic on a Band and all that, and also getting into the avant-garde world with Yoko. But then, you know, a lot of Beatle fans are aware of what Paul brought into the fold, too. You know, adding all the tapes for Tomorrow Never Knows, you know, uh, doing the Mellotron intro for Strawberry Fields, and he was also into experimental music, too, at that time. So, um, you know, do you think that that perception of John being more groundbreaking is is also accurate or is that unfair i think it's to to I, I, I think it's more accurate in a way i mean and, and 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 it's hard to say that given the you know as you say the real breadth of stuff that paul has done but my impression is that um you know even though we're talking about with john a much smaller body of work necessarily john didn't mind just putting out anything that struck him as what he was interested in at the time. And I think Paul was a little more conservative about that. I mean, yes, Paul was the one with the tape loops, and Paul was the one interested in avant-garde classical music. And yet, you didn't really see him doing that much about that publicly. The loops that he brought in ended up on John's songs, mostly, I think. Mm. Um, and mm. yeah. then when he began writing classical music, I mean, this is this was one of the things that I found kind of strange as a classical reviewer, was that, okay, here is a guy who knows about Stockhausen and Berio and all of these people that he was listening to in 1966, 67. And yet when he's writing classical music, it tends to be late 19th century, early 20th century stuff. I didn't really understand that. You know, I thought, okay, he 
can be writing the classical music of his time, like many classical composers are. And yet I think he I think he was a little timid about doing it. I mean what I would love to hear the stuff in his closet, you know, the the reels of tape of experiments and things that he hasn't put out. Um, and I think he shared that trait with George in a way. You know, George apparently on the anthology um, nixed um, some of the more experimental things that they did. I can't. What, what's the What's the big one? Carnival, <laughs> Carnival of Light. Carnival, Carnival of Light. Light. Mm-hmm. Yes, and there were and there were a couple of other things lying around. And George also was the one who shortened um, the version of Shout that they put on because he thought it was too self indulgent. Um, actually, cut out his own repetitions uh, at the end. Um, cause he thought mm. it was too long and, and he was the one who made the edit of, you know, my name, look up the number because he thought the full thing was too self-indulgent. Um, so George and, and Paul, I think, share that kind of conservatism about what to put out. And John would put out, you know, well, like with the lions. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, uh, I don't think any of the others would have put that out and they definitely wouldn't have put out two virgins either. And certainly not with the cover art, um, as we learned pretty much from Ringo's interview in the anthology. Yes. Um, yeah. so yeah, John was, I, I think this kind of thing is why John is perceived as more groundbreaking. You would then have to ask the question, was the stuff he was more groundbreaking with necessarily worth being groundbreaking with it in some cases? And, and in, in some cases, I think in, in terms of the more straightforwardly political and um, um, soul-bearing stuff, yeah, it probably was worth it. And um, people have different opinions about the avant-garde stuff probably. But um, hmm. so Speaking of the avant-garde stuff, watching this movie – and uh, when it would get into these uh, quick stretches where they were quick responses, John, Paul, 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 John, John, <laughs> I couldn't help but think of the song John and Yoko on the wedding album. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Yoko, John, John, Yoko, back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> so now we've got Life with the Lions and the wedding album mentioned and two virgins. This is an all avant garde show here. Well, okay. I was also going to mention. Um, what a shame, Mary Jane. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that's true. That's another, I mean, that's another, actually, that's a Beatle era song that, yeah. that didn't come out. I mean, that didn't show up until the bootlegs first, you know, first showed mm-hmm. up on bootlegs. And then they finally put it out on, on, uh, in the anthology. And, and I actually like that song a lot. Uh, and I, I really wish that they had, uh, I can imagine the discussion that, that went in with that song. Especially, especially when John was pushing to release it as a single. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, that, uh, it, and it's a it's a very listenable song, I think. And, you know, as opposed to as opposed to, I think if if it had been you know back in the day, if they had gone with that instead of uh, Revolution Number no. Nine, I think that would have gone over a lot smoother. Hmm. I think it's, it still would have been strange, and there's hmm. no there's no question about it. But I think it's uh, you know it's a I think it's a, you know, it's a very well done song. It's a, it's a, it's a very art. art. I think you could call it just use the word art, you know. It, and I think, you know, Yoko would definitely agree that it was art, because that's what she, you know. But it, it's, it's definitely an art type of thing, and I think it's a great song. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I agree with that, but uh, yeah, I think you might be in the minority there, Steve. Okay, well, whatever. I think, I, I, I've always enjoyed listening to it. So I think if that song had been released as a Beatles song in, in the late '60s, there a lot of fans would have said, "What the hell is this?" Yeah, you know. But they also said that about Revolution Number no. Nine too. Right. So right, you know. And I don't forget what Steve's. I understand what Steve's saying about uh, Mary Jane. If Mary Jane maybe would trim down to like a minute, uh, we'd all accept it more, like we do Wild Honey Pie. <laughs> But if Wild Honey Pie went on for six to seven minutes long, then <laughs> we'd roll our eyes going, how could they possibly put that out? Right. right. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I actually can handle Mary Jane for a couple, you know, a couple minutes. But, yeah, you're right. It probably would have been better off trimmed down. So, hmm. 
So maybe in a okay. way what, what, what we're saying or what, what Darren's saying, and, and I, I kind of agree in a way, is that um, Paul had these avant-garde ideas too, but he knew uh, if he was going to put them out how to keep them trimmed down to some sort of normal um, expanse. Mm. Right. Yeah. He's, always been, he's always been so self-conscious about himself and how the world would perceive him. Mm-hmm. You know, even to the degree that, like, the first two Fireman albums wouldn't go out as a Paul McCartney album. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he, he has to label it something else so that, you know, the, the public probably is expecting a Paul McCartney album to sound a certain way. And that's something that's a diversion from that, so you can't call it Paul McCartney. But he had it both ways there. I mean, by the time that album was released, I don't think anybody on the planet didn't know it was really him. You know, it was, it was a little bit like the Bernard Webb thing. You know, he was experimenting with writing a song for Peter and Gordon and wanting to see whether it would be a hit, even if nobody knew it was him. But everybody right. knew it was him, you know. But it, as, as, I re, as I recall, the sales, the sales on the Fireman album was really were really low. Uh, yeah, well, that, you know, they didn't. The first two albums didn't even come out until the '90s, when certainly sales-wise, Paul's career was in, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, at least from a sales point of view, it was mm-hmm. uh, it was in a, a, a low a low ebb. Let's put it that way. Although Flaming Pie, when it was released, which is obviously a mainstream out al- a stream album, did debut at number two. Mm-hmm. But uh, but still, it was he was you know he wasn't having hit singles by that point. And actually, uh, you know, I have a feeling that again, the mainstream rock audience probably wasn't even aware of the two Fireman albums because I think really those were you know. <sighs> Kind of the those were mainly the purvey of the you know the hardcore mm-hmm. Beatles McCartney fandom, right? You mm-hmm. know that other than that, mm-hmm. other than people who say read Beatle fan magazine, probably not too many people were were really aware of uh, even the existence of those two albums. Whereas the the third quote unquote Fireman album was much closer to a a mainstream McCartney album. But that didn't sell. That did not. No, it didn't sell either. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's very true. Yeah, and in fact, in in fact, I think you could probably make an argument that new had a lot of fireman elements in it, and I I don't know that that is what killed it. I mean, what what kept it down, like you know, from better. But but basically, it's just that he, you know, he's just not an artist that sells anymore. mm Mm-hmm. Which is too- well, you know, if you follow what you just said, Al, you take an album like, like Flaming Pie, which debuted at number two, which I believe was mm-hmm. the highest debuting album of his solo career. That's more what the public expects of Paul. Yeah. And then if he does experiment, then Electric Arguments is closer to a Paul McCartney album, but with a lot of experimentation, too. Mm-hmm. And the public yeah. doesn't, they don't gravitate to that. Right. So, yeah. you know, here you are, you're admiring John Lennon for being experimental. And doing groundbreaking things, if Paul tries to do it, you know the public doesn't take to it but as the, well. But at the same time, he was going to feature appreciate in his Japanese concerts until they were canceled. He was mm. going to he was going to do the robot thing, and and that is very. Exper- I mean, you can't get much more experimental than that video and what they were planning to do there. I mean, that was. That was pretty off the edge as far as you know, as far as mainstream goes. It it wasn't, you know. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it was maybe it was the idea of the Japanese audiences that he thought the Japanese audiences would have done it, would have enjoyed it more because he certainly didn't could have done it here, but he he didn't. So right. and actually, when you when you think about when you were just saying about you know John's supposed groundbreaking music, the his groundbreaking material is really from the Beatle years, you know, other than because other than John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, there really is nothing from that, you know, that decade of his, you know, his his solo career that can really be called groundbreaking. You know, certainly sometime in New York City was hardly groundbreaking. 
sophomoric political songs with a you know with a almost like a 50s rock and roll band backing an album of oldies you know two other albums mind games and walls and bridges which you know are very good albums but there's certainly nothing groundbreaking about either of them and obviously uh there was nothing particularly groundbreaking of the you know about the material that he recorded in August of 1980. Mm-hmm. You know, so really, as far as you know, the uh, John as a an artist doing groundbreaking music, you're really talking about the Beatles and John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, and that's it. Mm-hmm. There's this other issue here, which is, and I've noticed this amongst a lot of Beatle fans. If you ask who your favorite Beatle is, they'll say. They'll say John, but if they pick a second person, if they said John, they'll say George. Mm. It seems like there's a connection between the two of them, and I personally mm-hmm. think that they, they have that image of the fact that lyrically their songs are more personal and more powerful. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, even one of the, the songwriters who was interviewed here in the, uh, in the documentary was saying that when you write personal stuff, then you're more universally ex- uh, accepted or appreciated more. And uh, that doesn't mean that Paul hasn't written personal music. He's done quite a lot of it, but he's so well known for everything else that he does that he doesn't have that perception. Uh-huh. I think John's, John's personal stuff is, is almost like a therapy session, uh, and Paul's more personal stuff is a Hallmark card. You know, that could be why. That you know doesn't change the perception. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, that his more personal songs, that Paul's more personal songs tended to be love songs. You know, like for instance, mentioning Flaming Pie. Uh, that's an album that, at least for me, is is very tough to listen to a lot of times mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. we know the circumstances under which most of the songs on that album were written. You know, it was while Linda was going through her ultimately losing battle with uh, with breast cancer and songs like Calico Skies and Some Days and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, a few of the others are they're very tough listens sometimes, you know, just emotionally. They're very tough listens because you realize the the circumstances so, in a way, he's writing very deeply personal songs oh, there. Yeah. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, with, with an underlying reason behind yeah. it. But at the same time, and you've got Little Willow on there, which was yes. dedicated to, to Maureen Starkey, and Maureen. it's kind of like, you know, to going out to, you know, her kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and the song we were singing, you know, yes. it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's uh, Paul talking about the early years writing with John. Yeah. So, you know, you've got songs throughout Paul's solo career. Tug of War is one of them to me. Uh, definitely one of the, the greatest poetically of all the songs that Paul's ever written to me is The End of the End, which I think is extremely yes. powerful. Sure. You know, so there are these moments when Paul has really put out powerful songs lyrically and very personal, too. But he's just not as known for it, because certainly I would think if you were to do a percentage the songs that John wrote and George wrote were far more personal, song per song, on their albums. And although in the case of George, a lot of that was spiritual, that is, in effect, also being personal, too. So, um, you know, I think it carries that weight to it. You know, the songs of John and George have the perception of having, you know, they're far weightier songs because they're so strong lyrically and, and personal. So I think a lot of people appreciate John and George in many ways more so than Paul. George may also benefit from the, um, let's say, the the tyranny of John and Paul in the in the sense that um, since he was allowed so few um, songs on each album, the songs of his that got in were absolutely the cream of the crop that he was he was writing. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You know, you end up with a, a situation where we know that by Abbey Road he had plenty of songs stocked up. But what do we get? We get "Here Comes the Sun" and something two incredible, incredible songs. You know, some of the best music on that record. And I think mm-hmm. that um, 
possibly because he was being held back and only his best stuff came out on on as as Beatles tracks of his um I think those stand out in a way in retrospect more than than some of John's and Paul's do even but you know what I find I mean I I well, like to I, mm, go ahead I I agree almost entirely with what you just said with the one exception of the Let It Be album because George had written some of the stuff for All Things Must Pass by then. Right. And when you think about it, I Me Mine and For You Blue, mm -hmm. uh, they're not nearly as strong to me anyway as the title track to All Things Must Pass. That's or, true. <clears throat> or, or Beware of Darkness, for that matter. Yeah, and some of those things were rehearsed during the Let It Be sessions, but um, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to know how, how those things got chosen, why those two, but... Um, you know what I when I I like to think of myself as being you know impartial in a certain way you know that I that I recognize the value of all four of them really and yet when it comes down to you know back in the days when we used to make cassettes to put in the Walkman if we were going out you know for a walk or a drive or something and would just put your favorite things I mean I invariably had things like I saw her standing there and while my guitar gently weeps, but almost the rest of my tape tended to be Lennon stuff for whatever reason. I mean, there'd be paperback writer, but there'd be rain. There'd be strawberry fields. There'd be come together. There'd be, uh, you know, there'd be some other McCartney's too. Maybe I'm down. I don't know. Um, but the, the things that I always tend to single out as the best things, my favorite things in the Beatles catalog are mostly John's, you know, Day in the Life, which of course is both, but it's you, you think of it as mostly his. I'm the Walrus, you know, just all of those tracks that are just a, a little bit out there. A lot of them um, mm. just seem to me to be the most. They're, they're, they're the ones that somehow or other end up on my tape when I make one, or now it would be a CD or a playlist or something, but. Um, so, I mean, even if I, I try to pretend that I don't have that preference, uh, it, it seems to actually be there. Hmm. I was to say, one of the things that, I, that we haven't really touched on is how many people actually did not pick Leonard or McCartney, but actually picked George Harrison uh, or Ringo. And actually, there were quite a, there were several, I think it was 15, that picked Ringo out, or picked George out of that, uh, right. um, that, uh, you know, that ch chose him. And that was, I thought that was kind of interesting actually that instead of Lennon and McCartney, they actually pulled ahead and uh, pulled away from both of them and picked George. Um, there's a, that says something about the, about the love for George that, you know, that there are people that no matter, even though, uh, Lennon and McCartney have gotten a lot of uh, press over the years, there are, there are, are some loyalists for George Harrison, which is really kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if um, the fact that George died so young, it gets back to a point I made at the beginning, helped uh, with his exposure uh, to the mainstream. People, uh, oh yeah, right, George Harrison, uh, after he passed, uh, if that helped uh, raise awareness to what uh, George, was, George was all about. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he would have gotten those 15... Uh, plugs in the movie if he were still with us. Just an outside thought. I don't know. I, it's it's possible that you know that they they're taking in not only George's songwriting ability, but also they're thinking of his ability as uh, you know as a, as a guitarist. Uh, the the you know the influence of the Indian music, which as time wore on, we became more comfortable with. We certainly weren't very comfortable with it back in the 60s, but as time wore on, we were able to see the beauty of songs like "Within You, Without You," and "The Inner Light," particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you know that may be a factor that it's not just the songs that he wrote, but you know the whole package, and also I think that uh, the the votes for Ringo I think uh, also kind of kind of meld into that because it shows just how all the different elements that each of the four brought to the group and made it into this this perfect melting pot of you know of musical genius, if you will. 
But do you think, Al, that the average person out there recognizes what each of the four of them brought to the group? I mean, I can't I, tell you how many times I've seen online some people saying, well, the Beatles are really John and Paul. You yeah. know, or they, they really have a limited view. A lot of people do. They don't realize all the contributions. I think, that, I think musicians, and obviously the vast majority of the people that responded to this were musicians. And I think a lot of them, they, they do understand, uh, you know, what each one brought to the group that it wasn't that it wasn't just John and Paul. I think the ones that just say John and Paul are, frankly, are, you know, <laughs> social media idiots who, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, go on and uh, throw any old stupid comments uh, at the wall. Like, I'm sure Steve is aware of the amount of anti, uh, anti-Yoko mm-hmm. material that I still see on a daily basis. There's the... From- there's- Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Oh, there's oh, there's been a lot of it lately on Facebook. Yes. To the to the point where people have actually gotten out and said, "Let's cool it, folks." And and yeah. And I've gotten in a couple. I've said a couple of things too, but mm-hmm. it's it's really getting crazy. I mean, there's uh, we could do a whole show on that issue, but uh, yeah, that's that's really sad to to. Yeah. See. But there's but a lot of anti anti McCartney out there too, that I've noticed oh, sure. online. Oh yeah, and you know, then there always, uh, you know, there always has been, uh, for one reason or another, uh, you know, especially like especially the females with the the John girls versus the Paul girls and that nonsense, mm. which uh, you know, I just my tolerance level for that stuff is uh, extremely low. Uh, <sighs> And just other, you know, just idiots that are out there that just don't know, that really don't know anything about them, but uh, they'll just take a little, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, especially younger people that are you know, in social media that really don't know very much about them, but they just perceive that if they throw nonsense against the wall against John or against Paul, it'll get a reaction. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing, and and that really probably shouldn't be taken any more seriously than, uh, <laughs> frankly, some of the responses in uh, in this documentary. Well, if anything, I would have preferred if each person that was interviewed gave a reason why they why they showed, sure. and you'd mm-hmm. know a lot more than just you know saying John's name or Paul's name. Mm-hmm. But uh, getting back to what we were saying here before about George. I think he definitely has his legion of fans there that are that are extremely loyal. And I mm-hmm. think that one thing, I think there's a lot of people out there that will support, I hate to call it like the underdog, you know, because let's face it, George always was in the shadow of John and Paul as, as songwriters, and he wasn't given as much of a chance to put his songs on Beatle albums. But also, to be fair about this whole thing, George wasn't that prolific in the early years anyway. But still, a lot of people will sympathize. There'll always be that element out there. There's a lot of people that feel that way. You know, that George never got the credit that John and Paul did, so a lot of people are sympathetic to that, and will, you know, George could be a favorite for those people, apart from the fact that they love his music, too. So I agree. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people out there root for underdogs. Mm-hmm. Like, like Darren and I with the Mets. You know, and so. Al. <laughs> We've got three, at least three Met fans here, <laughs> and and a Jets fan, but we won't get into that. Um, you know, uh, when I found watching the uh, the movie, uh, I was constantly hitting the pause button on certain ones because they were particular, and I'm sure all uh, four of you also had particular musicians and actors and whatnot that you really wanted to hear what their response was going to be, but it mm. flew by so fast you had to go yeah. back. Uh, what caught my ear, uh, being the WFUV plays uh, a lot of uh, indie rock, a lot of alternative artists, a lot of uh, uh, newer acts, when they would appear, I was always, uh, my ears perked up to hear what they were going to say. And... Um, the ones who I would have thought more as pop artists, I expected to hear uh, that they liked Paul, and that wasn't always the case. The ones who I thought of more cerebral artists would pick John, and that wasn't always the case. The best mm. example is Brett Denon, who gave a very 
uh, very good insight into why he picked John Lennon. Brett Denon, if you're familiar with his music, I would say is more McCartney-ish uh, than uh, Lennon. Uh, but he went on about uh, his thoughts on why uh, he picked Lennon. And it kind of struck me as interesting, not what I would think he would have said. And to hear what Brett Denon did, in fact, say, you have to watch the film. <laughs> Uh, the fellow, one of them, uh, I forget the name, but the, from uh, Keen. Right. Were also, uh, yeah, the lead singer, right. Um, yes. His name escapes me now, but yes, he right. uh, he picked Paul, did he not? I think so. Yes, yeah. he did. Yes, yes he did. That was, that, I see, that's one instance where, and I've interviewed him, and I, his name is slipping me right now, the lead singer. Yeah, uh, me too. I could see him picking, yeah. the, or the members of the band Keen picking McCartney. They're a more melody-driven band. Uh, there was one in there that flipped by very quickly, was City in Color, whose real name is Dallas Green, who mm-hmm. has uh, no relation to the former Met and former Yankee. But he I... has uh, an album out with, with Pink right now, and together they call themselves You and Me. He actually said neither, which kind of got me grumbling a little yeah, bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, all right. Tomorrow when I'm going to play uh, the new You and Me, and maybe I'll drop it. And not play it, huh? What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, yeah? You're going to say neither? Cross <laughs> City and Color off tomorrow's playlist. Just kidding, but uh, that was and an yet, interesting response, too. And yet, like the members of Metallica, you got mm. actually a very mixed response there. I think there were, you know, there were, you know, there was even a Ringo vote in there, if I recall. Uh, Kirk Hammett from Metallica actually said... He's not as much into the Beatles as their solo work, <laughs> you know. And, yes, you know, I, I, I love that. hearing that. I, sure. I, I got to meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did anyone he, notice, he love wings. Yeah. It, did, did anyone get the impression that Justin Bieber needed a split second to try to figure out who who John they and were? Paul were? Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. undoubtedly. Like had that like John, who the Pope? Uh, oh, well, yeah, right, John. <laughs> What second reaction on his face to the question? Yeah. Hmm. Those the, the big the big uh, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, Miss Piggy. Those were the the big ones. Uh-huh. I also uh, I'm glad I can't. What I one of the things I came away with that made me smile was Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite's a John Lennon fan. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, end this conversation with one last question, and and that is. Why is there any need, do you feel, to pit one against the other here between John or Paul? I always remember asking the question, and I've asked it to first-generation fans, that when the, the Beatles first came out, people weren't necessarily saying, that's a John Lennon song, that's a Paul McCartney song. It was a Beatles song. Mm-hmm. So, you know, why, why is there any division? You know, I mean, it, it, in a perfect world, everybody would recognize how much each of the four of them brought to the group. And that without any one of the four of them, it wouldn't have been the Beatles anyway. But why do you think there is this need anyway to to make comparisons between John and Paul? It's just sort of a human thing, probably. You know, you get a, a bunch of people people that everyone can have different opinions on, and the opinions will start flying. It's just, I think, the nature of the business, business being human. Yeah, and that... In that era, I can remember, especially in the 60s, I can remember, you know, there being great debates about who was better, Clapton or Hendrix. Right. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, or, you know, who was the better drummer or, uh, you know, whatever. So those those kinds of debates are almost are almost natural. They're, uh, again, for those of us who are baseball fans, uh, they're, you know, a natural outgrowth of, you know, back when I was a kid and Mays and Mantle, you know, who's mm-hmm. better, that sort of thing. The, mm-hmm. I mean, this stuff's been going on since since Beatlemania days. I mean, there there was mm-hmm. this uh, I mean, there were people doing this this kind of thing back then, you know. In fact, I mean, you know, think back to the Ed Sullivan show with the, you know, with the little titles on the you know, screen. I mean, everybody was making judgments back then. But as far as now goes, I mean, again, it's all this 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 internet thing. You know, there's always these things coming up on the internet. Like I said uh, uh, last week, and and this is just one of those things that. You know, somebody thought of, and it was, and and they, 
and it picked up really well and it went viral and and uh you know it's it, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be important or it has to have a whole lot of significance it's just one of those things that just happens to click you know with social media and that's you know that's really where this whole thing is and i'm sure somebody will, the, the the john paul question is going to continue forever i mean you know but that's never going to drop there have been books written about it uh you know i mean it's it's never going to it's never going to fade away it's it's cute what they did here though i think I, I, you know but i again like i said earlier it's not something i would take very seriously cuz who are these guys? They're, they're, you know, a lot of these people we haven't even heard of. I personally would be more interested in what what actual fans have to say than than some of these people, especially Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> is is yeah, isn't he yeah. the Justin Bieber the topic of the next show? Is right. <laughs> right. Just, right. So. <laughs> yeah, we want to go viral. <laughs> yeah. is, is Justin Bieber bigger than the Beatles? Uh, <laughs> Oh, no. How about you, Darren? Why do you feel that there's this need to pit one against the other? Are you just, uh, would you agree with what everybody said? I would, I would what agree with what said? Alan and Steve said. It's human nature, you know, and, and, and Al uh, mentioned uh, the Mantle Maze thing. And then in a little more broader sense, there's the Mets Yankees and those folks in Chicago, I'm sure. Uh, there's Cubs White Sox. Uh, um, you know, in pro football today, is it Tom Brady or Al- Aaron Rodgers? It's interesting that the John Paul thing is a true friendly competition because they're both within the same band as opposed to rival bands. If this was, you know, and, and maybe that actually makes it more of an interesting point. Why has society uh, been pitting two artists in the same band against one another uh, when it's usually opponents, enemies, hmm. uh, friendly or not? Uh, but mm. I think ultimately, you know, even though they're both were bandmates, it's human nature to take sides. Did you like John better? Did you like Paul better? This song was better than that song. How could you pick Paul? He did silly love songs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they fostered yeah. a little bit of the competition themselves, too, during the Beatles era. I mean, if you listen, if you think about that exchange on one of those BBC shows that they were on where yes. um, uh the 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 I guess Brian Matthew is talking about uh, she's a woman and I feel fine and and mm-hmm. he says yeah. you know I like the B side she's a woman even better than the A side and John says I don't <laughs> like, you know it's really <laughs> clearly a competition there and um, and I think that I think that by the time we all began to know who was writing what you you could sense that there was a competition for the A side and there was competition for who had more stuff on the album um so in a way they set it up you know uh, they 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 set up the sense that there was a comp or a friendly rivalry let's say between them and that kind of led people maybe to to think about preferences between one or the other even though they may have liked all the stuff hmm Interesting. You know, one one of the reasons why the Beatles are so fascinating to me is because of the contrasting styles between each of the four of them. They all have similarities, and it's both the similarities and their contrast that made them work so well together. But sometimes I wish that, you know, for the people who prefer one or the other, and there are some fans who love John and dismiss Paul, I wish that, you know, that the fans who feel that way would just embrace both of them and, well, all four of them. For that reason, because that's part of what made them so interesting mm-hmm. in the first place. It's because they're right. not intel- they're not intelligent enough to uh, to be able to, to to grasp what each different one brought. You know, any any anyone who considers himself a fan who then puts down one of the others in the same group is is ridiculous. You know, mm. that's why when any when anybody ever asks me, you know, who my favorite Beatle is, I always say. It's the last one I heard. You know, <laughs> whoever was whoever sang the last Beatles song I heard is my favorite for that, and for those three minutes until I hear another one. You know, because there was yeah. because each one, it, you know, it was again a perfect melting pot. And you could see that from the minute that Ringo became the drummer, that that was he was the final piece in the puzzle, and that it was it was a perfect melting pot of talent. And um, and just musical and musical genius that you know that that contributed to the the phenomenon 
And people who, you know, who don't realize that, you know, and have to pit one against the other are morons. <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, there, there is... <laughs> there, there is that idea that, you know, you could break down all the Beatles songs to being John songs or Paul songs. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, there's so much more that went into their music than just who wrote it. So, you know, I still I still will always think of songs first with the songwriter. But when you're talking about the Beatles, it was this chemistry that the four of them had together that made the records great. The songs were still great because you had great songwriters. So, uh, but if you don't recognize the fact that it took all four of them to make that music, then you're not realizing, you know, the fact that it's, the, you know, the chemistry of the four of them that made them so powerful. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, that uh, that puts an end to this show. And um, if any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can always write to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. And um, if you want to get in touch with me directly, I have an email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. You can also check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I do want to make mention of the fact that every now and then I have a special contest on my show, and I'm, I feel very fortunate whenever I do have one. But uh, as the show airs, I have a special contest in which you can win the brand new Hunter Davies book, which is called The Beatles Lyrics, which I think we'll probably end up doing a show on here on Things We Said Today. Uh, possibly. So if you want to, if you want to, um, have a chance to win a copy of Hunter Davies' book, just go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Steve, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, they can do so. How? They can write to me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. And I'm all over Facebook too. I have my own page and I have a, a Beatles news page and a, um, and a Beatles examiner page. So I'm, I'm everywhere on Facebook. By the way, we do have our own Facebook page here for the show for things yes. we said today. Yes, we yeah. do. And we probably all have at least one or two individual Facebook pages. I have plain old oh, Alan sure. Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. <laughs> right. So. And I've got actually something that uh, that uh, I figure I could uh, promote a little bit. Uh, for many, many years, I've I've been saying that 1965 is the single greatest year in the history of rock and roll. And suddenly on New Year's Day, I decided, you know what? I think I really need to start showing why. So I began posting every day what I call number whatever of 365 reasons why why 50 years later, 1965 is the greatest year in the history of rock and roll. And what I'm doing is basically going through the year chronologically and putting up clips from YouTube of, of songs that were hits at that particular point in the year. And I'm doing that every day, and I'll be doing it through through the end of the year. So, you know, if you drop by either uh, my Facebook page or my Twitter account, uh, you can, you know, click on to, uh, you know, each day's... Entry each each day's entry. Thank you, Steve. Each day's entry in uh, in that in that series. That sounds like it sounds like a good idea for one of our shows. What was the Beatles' best year? Uh, we'll save that for another show. Oh, that would be that would be yeah. An that would be an interesting discussion. Yeah. Does then Al does do. Al think that it, it was 1965? Would Al say that? I don't know. It was it was the year when they were uh, when they reached the peak of their popularity. They were never as universally popular after 1965. Doesn't mean it was their best year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No, we could, we could we could we could have fun with that one. Mm-hmm. You know what else? All right. makes 1965, a special year. What's that? It was, it was the year that I was born. Anyway, um, <laughs> if I could, if I could just jump in very quickly. Go ahead. Uh, sure. I have a, 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 a radio page uh, on Facebook, which is called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. I encourage you to like that, and I post all kinds of music things and occasional sports things, or my email address. Uh, just spell my name, Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O, at WFUV.org. And for those not familiar with WFUV, probably outside of New York City or not, we're at 90.7 FM in NYC and WFUV.org. So. 
Yeah, yeah. And you are heard. You are heard on WFUV Monday through I Friday. Am? No, I'm sitting from... Yes, Monday through <laughs> Friday at 6 in the evening Eastern and weekends on our HD2 channel, Saturdays and Sundays, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and again 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. both days. Okay, great. This has been fun. Darren, thanks so much for joining us. We'd love to have you on back again. Thanks for asking me. I'd be more than happy to come back. All right. So, for Things We Said Today, this is Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and Darren DeVivo. Thanking all of you 